Welcome to uh, the event. Um, we are going to discuss the Bin Laden Papers, which is Nelly Lahoud's excellent new book, um, which got very favorable reviews already in the Washington Post. Uh, Nelly was the subject of uh, um, an entire segment on 60 Minutes on Sunday about the book and her work. Uh, Nelly is a fellow at New America. Uh, she's worked at West Point. Um, and uh, in fact, she was the first, she <clears throat> led the team uh, at West Point that was the first to uh, get the first tranche of documents from about about after the Bin Laden raid and published uh, the first paper uh, about, led the group that published the first paper about the about about papers. And uh, she has been uh, working on the about about papers uh, for really a decade now. Um, and so we're delighted that she's going to uh, share some of her findings. And uh, then I'll engage her in Q&A and then open it up to questions. If you do have questions, uh, put them in the Slido um, and I will uh, um, relay them to, to Nelly. So over to you, uh, Dr. Lahoud. Thank you, Peter, for this very generous introduction. And as I make it clear in the acknowledgments uh, to the book, that uh, this was all possible because of you, Peter, and your support and mentorship were crucial throughout. I also benefited from other New America colleagues. Uh, special thanks to David Sturman. New America also afforded me the resources to work with two very capable research assistants whose contributions will become apparent during the course of my presentation. I'd also like to add that I was exceedingly fortunate that the great historian of Islam, Michael Cook, read and commented on all the draft chapters of the book. And so did my friend Gary Apple, a brilliant playwright who gave me most valuable comments from a general reader's perspective. My editor at Yale University Press, Joanna Godfrey, Joe, championed this project before I was even ready to put together a book proposal. And how fortunate I was that the superb Ashley Valley at 60 Minutes took interest in my research. I have a different kind of thank you to add. The entire book is really a footnote to 18 additional minutes that the Special Operations Forces spent in the Abu Tabad compound to recover the files that formed the basis of this book. The Abu Tabad mission was supposed to be completed within 30 minutes. Admiral McRaven, who oversaw the raid, had completed a study published back in 1996 in a book entitled Special Ops that explored eight historical special operations missions and had concluded that speed was critical to achieving relative superiority by a small attacking force over a potentially larger and well-defended enemy. In his estimation, relative superiority is achieved if the mission is completed within 30 minutes and any delay equates with vulnerability. In his more, more recent book, um, Sea Stories, Admiral McRaven recounts that as the SEALs were nearing their allotted time window for the raid, they requested additional time on the ground. Captain Van Hooser, who oversaw the technical execution of the mission, explained, and I'm quoting, sir, they say they found a whole shit ton of computers and electronic gear on the second floor. Now, minutes earlier, the ground commander had communicated on the radio, for God and country, Geronimo, 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 the code for we had gotten Bin Laden. But McRaven immediately recognized the intelligence value of recovering Bin Laden's files. So he gave the go ahead. He kindly shared with me that at about 40 minutes, he told the SEALs to wrap it up. And about eight minutes later or so, we took off. So the book owes its existence to the perilous eight additional 18 minutes that the soft team spent in the compound. And thanks to their heroism, we have about 6,000 Arabic pages of Al-Qaeda's internal communications. I should note that the journey of writing this book didn't start with 6,000 Arabic pages on my desk. Between 2012 and 2017, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the DODNI, declassified several batches of files, first through the CTC at West Point, as Peter just noted, then directly on its own website. The ODNI conveniently categorized these files, and so the internal communications were readily accessible. 
But in November 2017, the CIA declassified thousands of files, a massive volume, consisting of text files, audio, and video. For the purpose of this book, I determined that the text files were the most important. With the help of two research assistants who are native Arabic speakers like me, we systematically went through all the text files, nearly 97,000 text files. Most of them turned out to be materials that are open, uh, available in the open source, such as newspaper articles and so on. But the bulk of Al Qaeda's internal communications existed within these files, in addition, of course, to those that had already been declassified through the ODNI. It is only after we identified the internal communications that my solo work on the book proceeded. The nearly 6,000 Arabic pages allow us to put together a chronological account of the key events that defined Al Qaeda in the decade between 9 11 and its founders' demise in 2011. They are brimming with revelations and lay bare Al Qaeda's closely guarded secrets and serve as a corrective to existing narratives about the group. We discover that flying planes into buildings when it was in fact Bin Laden's idea and not that of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. The papers also provide an unparalleled insight into the fate of Al-Qaeda post 9-11, including the nature of its role in global jihad. They take us into the Bin Laden household where nine out of the 16 people who lived there were children. We learn about their daily lives and we discover that most of the public statements that we heard Bin Laden deliver over the years were, were effectively co-authored by his daughters, Maryam and Sumeya. The papers also shed light on ongoing policy issues, such as Al-Qaeda's mistrust of the Afghan Taliban, the effectiveness of drones as a counterterrorism tool, the continued questions concerning, concerning Al-Qaeda's relationships with countries such as Iran, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia, making it abundantly clear that Al-Qaeda is not just a non-state actor, but an anti-state actor. And unexpectedly, I was able to piece together how Bin Laden's security was compromised by identifying who his real courier was. He was not, as the CIA narrative claimed, Abu Ahmad al-Kuwaiti, who lived in the same compound and was killed during the raid. To be clear, I don't know what went right with the CIA, but I have a solid idea of what went wrong with Bin Laden. I'm happy to discuss any of these themes during the Q&A, but let me focus in the remaining minutes that I have about Al-Qaeda's fate post 9-11. We discover an, an afflicted Al-Qaeda to use the description of its leaders. When the Taliban regime collapsed in December 2001, Al-Qaeda was effectively shattered. Bin Laden had to disappear out of necessity and he cut off all communications with his associates. When he resumed contact in 2004, most of Al-Qaeda's senior leaders were either killed or detained by Pakistan and Iran. The second tier leaders who were still at large apprised bin Laden's in their letters of their afflictions and made it clear to him that it was no longer safe for them to stay in the Afghan region. They were, they were hiding mainly in the Fatah, the federally administered um, tribal areas of Pakistan. As early as 2004, perhaps even earlier, they feared being betrayed by a large segment of the Afghan Taliban. Their dreary letters included one promising item. When God knew of our afflictions and helplessness, one letter, one letter read, he opened the door of jihad for us in Iraq. We should move all the brothers to Iraq. Clearly, the 2003 Iraq war appeared like a lifeline for Al-Qaeda. To be clear, Al-Qaeda had nothing to do with the rise of jihadism in Iraq. And in 2004, it was Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi and not bin Laden, who was the most powerful leader on the jihadi landscape. Bin Laden didn't rule out sending his brothers to Iraq, but his first decision was to require his brothers to hide. This was an order and not an advice, he wrote to them. He authored sending Hamza al-Rabiya, whom he appointed as the leader of international terrorism, to go to Iraq and to set up an independent unit dedicated to orchestrating international terrorism. Before Hamza Rabia had a chance to pack his bag, he was eliminated by a drone strike. Al-Qaeda's ability to mount international terrorism did not recover. 
Though the leaders of Al-Qaeda cheered some of the international attacks attributed to Al-Qaeda, their role did not go beyond being spectators. The CIA during campaign ensured that hiding became their modus operandi. The drones were unquestionably an effective tool against Al-Qaeda and other militants in the Fatah. Al-Qaeda's leaders refer to the drones as a calamity with which you have been afflicted. To be sure, it wasn't all the CIA's doing. Al-Qaeda's security committee admitted that, and I'm quoting, after careful and precise examination, we have concluded that the demise of all the brothers who were killed by drone strikes resulted from their own mistakes. The enemy's success is not due to their brilliance or modern superior technology, but rather it has to do with the brothers repeatedly neglecting to comply with basic security measures that should be clear to everyone by now. According to the papers, Al-Qaeda Security Committee believed that it, was, that it worked out not just how the drones operated, but also how they could be evaded. The success of the drones, they believed, relied on spies on the ground, sending signals to locate a target. Al-Qaeda was convinced that Pakistan's ISI was helping the CIA by recruiting spies. But Al-Qaeda Security Committee was also convinced that it was simple to evade the drones. All the brothers needed to do was to hide. When I said earlier hiding became Al-Qaeda's modus operandi, I wasn't exaggerating. We're not talking about avoiding carrying arms in the streets. The simple act of taking the car to the garage was sufficient to compromise a jihadi's security and hasten his martyrdom. By the end, we find bin Laden urging his brothers to evacuate the Fatah altogether and to move them to other cities in Pakistan. His top associate told him that the men prefer dying in the Fatah rather than risk moving to cities where they could be captured by the ISI. While the drones were raining devastation on his brothers in the Fatah, bin Laden continued to itch for more international terrorism. Al-Qaeda's leaders repeatedly told him that we can barely move and our circumstances do not permit us to spend money on terrorist attacks. By 2002, 2010, he warned that Al-Qaeda was in decline and unless it changed its strategy, it would come to an end as an organization. He spent most of that year devising a new strategy that in his mind would achieve a balance of terror with the United States. He methodically planned to sink a large number of crude oil tankers carrying oil to the United States, prioritizing the largest vessels. He thought of all the details. Large and small surveillance methods, the specific wooden or rubber boats that would evade being detected by the radars of nearby vessels, to the volume of explosives necessary, and the arch position that should be shaped, that the volumes should be shaped to penetrate deep into the, the vessels. You get the picture. I did not take his words for it. I consulted my friend, Commander Kurt Albo from the US Navy, who told me that for the most part, bin Laden had done his homework. Ultimately, Bin Laden's goal was to thrust the United States into a severe economic crisis, adversely affecting the income of every American citizen. He predicted that the American people would take to the streets, replicating the anti-war protest um, against the Vietnam War, and demand that their government change its, its foreign policy and withdraw its military forces from the Middle East. To be clear, this was exactly the objective that he had hoped to achieve through the 9-11 attacks. And though he continued to refer to the 9-11 attacks as a victory, he admitted in his letters that the attacks did not deliver the decisive blow that he had expected. So if 9-11 didn't, what made him think that sinking, sinking oil tankers would? The answer lies in who bin Laden was, and we get to know him pretty well through the papers. We don't really need to study 6,000 pages to conclude that bin Laden was a mass murderer. But by itself, this description risks suggesting that bin Laden succeeded in his political endeavor. Bin Laden was convinced that by sacrificing his fortune and the cause of jihad, he was helping fellow Muslims who suffer the yoke of dictatorship. 
He firmly believed that if the United States stopped its support of the dictators who rule over Muslim majority states, the jihadis could fight these regimes on a level playing field and would easily bring them down. He miscalculated on so many fronts. Bin Laden's papers paint a picture of a devoted father and husband, a caring leader who worried about his men and their families, but ultimately a failed terrorist leader who, shockingly, I should note, lacked a basic awareness of the limits of terrorism and a below than sophomoric understanding of international relations. By the end of my research on the book, I was also surprised by how the counterterrorism community had hyped up the image of Al-Qaeda for years, allowing one of bin Laden's top associates to write in the same paragraph, and I'm quoting, though we have not succeeded in mounting an international terrorist attack, we are nevertheless achieving our objective, namely terrorizing and deterring the enemy and engaging them in a war of attrition. Indeed, the enemy are spending much money on their security and are terrorized on an ongoing basis. They do not feel secure at all. They admit this and are certain of it. What I am trying to say is that we are advancing, even if we do not succeed in carrying out a specific attack, because we are succeeding overall. Effectively, he was saying, we're operationally impotent, but they don't know it. Thanks for the papers, we now do. Thank you, I will end with that. Well, thank you, Nelly. Just to, to kind of uh, run through a few questions that you um, just raised. So, um, you know, there was a there's a there's a common narrative that the Pakistanis must have known that Bin Laden was in Abbottabad. Um, of course, Sai Hirsch wrote a um, a piece in the London Review of Books that um, essentially said that the raid was a, a joint operation between this Pakistan and the United States. That's a very extreme view uh, of the, the Pakistanis must have known. So, um, um, but you know, Sai Hirsch uh, got a lot of a publicity for this. Uh, piece of journalism. Um, in fact, so many people logged on to the London Review of Books website that it crashed when his piece came out because basically it, it suggested that the, the raid in Abbottabad was sort of essentially uh, a fake uh, that was cooked, cooked up by the Americans and the Pakistanis. So let's just start with that. Is there any truth to any element of Hirsch's theory? Um, I do mention um... Hirsch's theory in the book, and I am a fan of Seymour Hirsch, but on that, on that account, um, actually, uh, even a cursory reading of the letters would make it very, very clear that bin Laden and his associates went to great lengths to avoid being uh, um, detected and to avoid the local Pakistani authorities. Um, now, uh, um, I don't know what the Pakistani authorities knew, but I can be sure of the letters. They, um, they clearly, you know, as Hirsch claimed, um, that somehow they, they, held, they had held, uh, you know, Bin Laden a prisoner. I mean, you know, uh, bin Laden, if, if they did, Bin Laden didn't know it. Um, and uh, and the, the, it, it, it was the way the security measures that they adopted were impenetrable. And as far as, um, and penetrable until, until they did. And as far as the local Pakistani authorities were concerned, um, there were two local Pakistani brothers who lived in the compound, Abu Ahmad al-Kuwaiti and, and his brother, both of them with their families. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there was, you know, the, the, the Bin Laden family, um, you know, they didn't allow their children, they didn't allow children and grandchildren, all the children to play outside. So clearly they were not really living comfortably or feeling secure. Um, so I, I can't see, and, and I mean, we, don't, we also don't need just the letters. I mean, Bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri's public statements against the Pakistani authorities, calling on Pakistanis to take up jihad against their government. I mean, if they really knew that, he was, that, that, that Bin Laden was there, why not get rid of him? Why not eliminate him? What was... I can't see the wisdom um, of the Pakistani government to actually keep him to keep him there. Uh, so I, I I find I find this to be uh, uh, I mean you know the papers really show that there is no basis um, for for um, Pakistan enabling. Yeah, 
and and there's no evidence just to clarify leaving aside Pat Hirsch's sort of um, essentially conspiracist uh, view of what happened a lot of people just say well look he was a, a mile away from the Pakistan's version of West Point therefore somebody in the Pakistani national security apparatus must have known is there any evidence in the all the letters and all the memos that you've read that suggests he had any uh, dealings with anybody in the Pakistani government or military or had anything other than a hostile view of Pakistan's national security and, 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 and government? They are throughout consistently hostile. I mean, there are reference to Pakistani brothers and they were working particularly in the Fatah. There were so many anti-state, all the, all the Pakistanis in the Fatah, the, the reason why they, they, they went and, and tried to hide in the Fatah is because they were all they were all opposed to the Pakistani government. So there isn't a single reference um, that showed any collaboration with the Pakistani government. In fact, um, bin Laden's public statements were so um, hostile against, and, and so did the Imam Zawahiri, against the, the Pakistani government that at one point, bin Laden's top associate in, in the Fatah urged him, could you please tone it down? Because they are killing us out here. They want them... They were convinced, as I said in my presentation, they were convinced that the Pakistani ISI, Pakistan's ISI, was collaborating with the CIA, was helping the CIA in terms of in the, in the drone in the drone campaign. And they were urging, could you please turn it down because we can't really bear it. Maybe if we told them that we don't want to fight you, we're just fighting the Americans, maybe they'll leave us alone. We can no longer stand it. So clearly the hostility is beyond question. The hostility towards Pakistan is unquestioned. And then switching gears, you also mentioned Iran. So, um, you know, during the Trump administration in particular, although it had been also the case in previous administrations, a sort of a narrative gathered strength as Iran and Al Qaeda were in some sense allied. And, you know, obviously there was, uh, as you know well, there a, a, quite a number of bin Laden's family members and also leaders of Al Qaeda were living in Iran under some form of house arrest for much of the decade after 9-11, and some of that continues even to this day. But what's your analysis of the relationship between bin Laden, al-Qaeda, and Iran based on these documents? Actually, this is actually quite related to Pakistan, because for a long time, as, as, as you know, Peter, I already did a study from New America, and I was very certain, judging by the letters, that um, you know, there is nothing that shows that Iran was, was enabling al-Qaeda. But what I really couldn't work out is that why would Al Qaeda go to Iran in the first place if they hated them so much? And this is really where it was very helpful to have looked at all the papers. And this is when I realized that early on, this was not an option for them. But what they did in the, um, uh, in the aftermath of Operation Enduring Freedom, some of them fled to Pakistan. And in Pakistan, they were arrested. There was this comprehensive campaign of arrest where they discussed that 600 brothers or more were actually captured. So they had no other option but to cross illegally into, um, into Iran. Now in Iran, it was not just a question of house arrest. This is what bin Laden had hoped that his family and, and others would be under house arrest. Um, they were actually in, in much more miserable conditions. And at certain point, um, you know, they were all put in one in one compound under security measures. They were all living together. They didn't provide, they the, the Iranian authorities didn't provide um, basic uh, basic services in terms of the school, the, the children's schooling in the in, in those places. The women and children weren't weren't afforded um, medical attention. At some point they revolted. The Al Qaeda people revolted against against the um, uh, the prison authorities, and many of them were injured, including Suleiman Abu Ghaith. Um, and another time, they also revolted. So it was at least twice that they revolted. Um, to be clear, they, 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 there was a prison riot, essentially. Right? Precisely, precisely. Um, and and uh, at one point when they started when Iran started releasing um, the prisoners uh, as a result of um, Al-Qaeda taking on a, um, 
uh, capturing, kidnapping an Iranian diplomat, and perhaps because they there were other reasons, not just the diplomat, there were other reasons why they started uh, releasing them. They were they were a headache for the Iranians, um, and uh, um, you know we know that when Bin Laden's wife Khidia and their son Hamza were were, were released, Al Qaeda senior leaders um, sent a message through Hamza to his father that you really need to do your best to help us get out of here. And please don't worry if we're gonna be martyred in, in the Fatah. We'd rather be martyred rather than be, rather than stay here in those, in those conditions. Um, so again, there is, there is absolutely no basis for any of the reporting that suggests that Iran uh, uh, was, was helping Al Qaeda. And also there is no basis for any of the reporting that suggests that Saudi Arabia helped Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda, to be clear, for those of us who've been studying Al Qaeda for a long time, it's Al Qaeda 101. Al Qaeda rejects the nation state system. It's not going to be really um, doing the bidding for any of these of these state actors. So, um, so it's it's. Uh, I'm afraid, you know, this is it's it's. And and yes, it wasn't just the Trump administration. It was also the Obama administration, and I remember reading um, at one point the director of the National Intelligence, um, James Clapper, claiming that there is a um, marriage of convenience between Al Qaeda and 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 Iran. And frankly, that has to be the most inconvenient marriage of convenience that I've ever heard of. But what about? I mean, just the counter argument would be Iran did house these. I mean, they may not have been housed in a particularly pleasant fashion, but for a decade after 9-11, senior leaders of Al-Qaeda were living in Iran and quite a, quite a number of um, quite a number of bin Laden's family members. So what, what is that? How would you characterize, even though it was not comfortable for them and there was a prison riot, two of them, in fact, as you point out, um, they were living under house arrest, not great. They would have preferred to be somewhere else, but it, this was, it, it is something. So what is it? So firstly, put yourself in the shoes of Iran. You know, they haven't had diplomatic relationships with the United States since 1980. Do they really want them to hand them over to, you know, what, what sort of, do they really want to do the United States a favor? You know, it's understandable from, according to their politics, that they don't want to, they don't want to help the United States. But there was more to it than that. And I think Iran, like the United States, overestimated um, Al Qaeda's operational abilities. And some of the letters, you know, again, I don't know what the Iranian thought, but ju judging by what um, the Al Qaeda detainees thought and Al Qaeda uh, themselves, that the Iranians wanted to use them as a bargaining chip against, um, so that they would ab be able to put pressure um, on what was, particularly on what was going on in Iraq. And uh, there, is, there is a very, um, strong letter that at some point Bin Laden's daughter he drafted and it was supposed to come out under her name. Um, uh, you know, it was it was addressed to the, to Khamenei, to the supreme leader of Iran, and she told him that you've been putting pressure on us throughout this time, and I want to let you know and make it clear to you that my father will never compromise his principles, even if you were to even if you were to sacrifice all his children and grandchildren. It couldn't be any clearer that, that Al-Qaeda had no interest in compromising its principles to enable, um, to enable Iran. But what Al-Qaeda did, and it's, it, it, it felt pressured by the fact that most of Al-Qaeda senior leaders and their families were in Iran. So the thing that Al-Qaeda didn't do is to speak publicly about this they kept the lid on it. And Iran didn't speak publicly about it. So there was this kind of almost, if you like, an understanding that we don't talk about it, but they were both scared. Iran was hoping that, you know, if it keeps the lid on it, Al-Qaeda would not attack them. They really didn't know that Al-Qaeda didn't really have the capability to attack them because when they, when Al-Qaeda's leaders um, came together and they said, you know, we really have to do something about Iran because everybody is accusing us of being uh, supported by Iran, 
um, you know, the most that they could do is perhaps start a PR campaign against the Iranians. They didn't have any, they didn't have, you know, the detainees in Iran had more power to, to do something against the Iranian authorities than, than Al-Qaeda was able to do something uh, um, against Iran. So, so yes, both of them decided to go along and not discuss uh, this issue, not make it public. This served Iran. And it didn't, though it didn't serve Al Qaeda. It didn't. It uh, it it uh, you know it, they they still thought that they could get the detainees. Now the turning point. It's not just the riot in prison, and it's not just the um, uh, the the diplomat, the Afghan diplomat. The turning point is when Bin Laden's daughter Iman escaped from uh, uh, from detention, and she went through, we went all the way to the Saudi embassy and the situation became public. Her brother, who is in Syria, Abdurrahman, spoke with Al Jazeera and publicized it. And this is at that point when Bin Laden asked his daughter to write this letter addressed to Khamenei, but then he stopped it. And then the same letter ended up coming out on jihadi websites signed by his son Khaled. Um, but, uh, but it, that was really the turning point. And we know it's a turning point because the remaining detainees were told by one of the Iranians, um, the, you know, their, their um, you know, the prison guards, they told them, now that it's become public, we have to let go of this. We have to, we have to start releasing. Now they didn't effectively release everybody at that time, but once Iman made, the detainees public because the Iranians had been denying it for years. And of course that was not true. But once this became public, they had to do something about it. And they started, they started, uh, they, they continued to do the, the release. Um, so a variety of questions coming in, um, which relate route to the 7-7, July 7th, 2005, London attack. Um, and then the planned attack on planes from 2006. Um, what do you make of, um, what do the documents say or not say about that? Um, and how would you rate the possibility that um, that these were linked to Al Qaeda, but didn't make it to bin Laden or into the documents? Or does it say something about the, what are the limits of using the documents as a way of um, establishing the truth or falsity of something? So, uh... You know, firstly, uh, on a number of bases. So, firstly, uh, there isn't, there are no, no letters that that show that Al Qaeda was involved, and Al Qaeda was involved in so many other things in terms of cheering attacks. But there are no suggestions in the letters, not a single suggestion that Al Qaeda was behind any of these attacks. Now, of course, you might say, well, maybe, maybe the letters are missing, but what, uh, uh, or, or were not recovered, and there were letters that were not recovered, but. Uh, when subsequent letters, 2005, only starting 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, when all these letters are, uh, uh, um, you know, keep talking about the operational impotence, when bin Laden kept uh, criticizing the brothers who were in charge of the International Terrorism Unit, um, there were two two brothers that come up in 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 those letters. Um, one is Abu Saleh al Sumali, the other is Abu Tuf, uh, brother Tufan. And you know these these two people. You know, firstly, Tufan is is somebody who is completely incompetent. His writing is like a kitchen sink approach um, to to terrorism. Abu Saleh al Sumali uh, writes about why we haven't succeeded. These are limited letters. We find Bin Laden really impatient with these with these two people. Um, we find Ayman al Zawahiri referring to to a brother to his brother Tufan as you know, and, and and here we see a bit of the sense of humor of Ayman al Zawahiri, where at some point you know it, it appears that brother Tufan writes about everything and wants to do everything, and he started writing about medicine, and we find in one of al Zawahiri's letters. That, that he had said to, to Tufan that uh, 
you know, even cooks and butchers have much more things to say about the spleen, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that your own comments. And so uh, completely uh, the International Terrorism Unit was completely incompetent. Now, at a certain point when bin Laden really wanted those attacks the, to sink these oil tankers attacks, and the person who's going to lead these attacks, Yunus al-Muritani, in one of his letters um, to, to bin Laden, he explains to, to him that he had nothing to do, that he has nothing to do with the International Terrorism Unit. And it's, it, 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 it is that poor. And we find bin Laden throughout telling, telling Atiya, you know, maybe you need to do something, maybe you need to replace them. And Atiya keeps saying, you know, I'll, I'll give them some guidance. Um, so not only are there no, no suggestions that, you know, no suggestions that they were, that they were involved in these attacks, but, but continued repetition in, in, um, uh, uh, in the letters that, that they were, that they lacked resources. Um, that they couldn't be operational. That suggests to me that that just as I mean, it, you know, some of the other attacks, for instance, uh, I mean, the 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 attack against the CIA officers that killed the CIA officers. Al Qaeda heard about it from the news. Al Qaeda heard about it from the news, and when Bin Laden saw the um, the, uh, the testament of Abu Dujana al Khurasani, the jihadi who carried out the attack. He was fuming because Abu Dajan al Khurasani said that this was that this this was to avenge um, uh, the leader of the Pakistani Taliban, Mahsud, and and Pakistani said and, and Bin Laden said, surely he should have said Palestine. That this is for Palestine, not to avenge people. So you know, on on so many of these operations that we thought that it was that that were reported to have been Al Qaeda, we know from the letters that it was not Al Qaeda. You mentioned the Taliban. Um, this is from former New America fellow Hassan Abbas, who's a professor at National Defense University. Uh, what about Bin Laden's views about Mullah Omar and what, what's the relationship? Obviously, there's the Pakistani Taliban, there's the Afghan Taliban. Sure. Um, so the, 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 the relationship between the Afghan Taliban is much more complicated than, than I ever thought. Um, and now, you know, because of the letters, I went back to some of the earlier jihadi sources that were available publicly. Um, and, and, and I'm referring specifically to the writings of Abu Musab al-Suri. Now, Abu Musab al-Suri tells us in a, in a book that he wrote in 1998 that uh, Mullah Omar was very supportive of the jihadis in Afghanistan but many senior leaders within the Taliban were not. Um, so I do question the issue that somehow Mullah Omar didn't know about the 9-11 attacks. My sense is, and judging by the bin Laden that we get to know, bin Laden wouldn't lie to Mullah Omar. In my sense, and, and, and also judging from bin Laden's own notes, um, he consulted with everybody. Everybody knew about the attacks that would be carried out by Al Qaeda from Afghanistan. Um, there were challenges at times, but Bin Laden did not lie to anybody and it's not as if it came out of nowhere. Having said that, the operational um, executions of attacks, nobody knew about them. Not even Bin Laden sometimes knew about the operational execution of certain attacks. So that was part of Al Qaeda's way of doing business in terms of secrecy was very, very important. So judging by the letters, um, uh, uh, we find that throughout, throughout the decade after 9-11, Bin Laden and his associates, Ayman al-Zawahiri and others, continue to respect Mullah Omar. They continue to think that he was steadfast um, and, uh, and he, was, he, was, he was a great support for the sincere Shia. Well, Ahmed was not alone. There were other sincere Taliban as well. But there were many other insincere Taliban around. 
And those who actually went on the names, in fact, they, they you know, Mullah Baradar and, and others, some of those who actually ended up going through um, doing those those uh, the the and you know entering into uh, negotiations with the United States, they were described by Al Zawahiri and by Bin Laden as traitors, hypocrites, and long before the peace agreement with the Taliban that was concluded in 2020. Long before that, Al Zawahiri feared that this was going to happen and that the Taliban would agree to such a peace deal that would render Al Qaeda impotent. And the nightmares came true in, in 2020. So, so I think the issue is been, I, 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 based on the letters, Bin Laden continued to have loyalty to Mullah Omar. I cannot, I cannot believe that he lied to Mullah Omar. Um, uh, but but the situation, the Afghan factionalism is a problem, not just for Al Qaeda, but for the Taliban themselves. Um, a question from Anonymous. Basically, would you agree with the idea that Al Qaeda was in a sense like Lee Harvey Oswald, somebody who was essentially trivial, who got lucky once and... Um, so it, you know, it's, it's a question that gets at the idea that 9-11 was the height of their power, not, you know, and, and a lot of things went right for them. And then after that, I think a lot of things started going wrong for them. Well, you know, they were behind 1998 East Africa bombings. They were behind, Al-Qaeda was behind the USS Paul. And to be clear, Al-Qaeda was behind the 2002 Mombasa bombings um, in November 2002. But the reason they were able to pull it off, it was it was against um, a hotel, an Israeli-owned hotel, and against uh, Israeli um, airliners that they did um, that they they the, those attacks in Mombasa. So Al Qaeda was behind those attacks, um, but the reason they were able to pull it off was because the operatives had been dispatched to East Africa um, at the end of two thousand or early two thousand one. They had left Afghanistan before Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, so it got lucky. I don't think, you know, I don't think that 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 it got lucky once. I think they're, they're, they're more than they're more than just got lucky once. Um, and one, one thing that I would like to add about this. Um, what what is what is important to, to keep in mind is the method. That, that bin Laden adopted and he carefully was, and, and he clearly was a master at, at planning. Um, he doesn't, he, he prefers, his, up, his, his preference is for very basic attacks that you can actually carrying out, carry out by going to Home Depot or basic stores that could not be evaded that could not be penetrated by technology. Simple attacks that could produce spectacular events. And for all the efforts that I know many governments are doing in terms of cyber, cyber security and um, surveillance and so on, his, his methods continue to be um, should be, we should be worried about, about his methods. Because? Well, because they cannot be penetrated. They cannot be really, you know, for somebody like, like Bin Laden, I mean, as, as you very well know, Peter, he was, he refused to use the internet. He refused to, um, to use the telephone. That's how he managed to evade the authorities for so long. So, uh, and I'm not suggesting we should stop cybersecurity and so on, all of this. But, but when, when we're talking about, you know, um, being able, for instance, one of his attacks for uh, 2004 that he had hoped to carry out were about derailing trains in the United States. And he precisely described how um, the operatives could remove about 12 meters of rail so that, you know, the, the, the trains could be derailed. This is something very, you know, you could use, you could use a compressor, a hydraulic jack, 
you know, things, he would tell them where they could buy them from. You know, nobody, nobody could actually find out what you're buying. You could do them in the, uh, you know, in the, at night, you can, you can work on these things. Things that, that are very difficult. Um, you know, if, if you maintain secrecy, as, as Al-Qaeda's operatives were trained to do, these are attacks that could really evade um, much of the surveillance that we have. Yeah, the Arab Spring uh, started happening in the last several months of Bin Laden's life. Of course, he didn't know that, that his life was going to end uh, um, as the Ar events of the Arab Spring were, were gathering steam. But you mentioned his daughters uh, playing a role in editing and writing his speeches. Um, obviously, you also mentioned um, Hamza, who, your wife with the PhD, who suddenly reappeared in February of in his life, uh, having been under house arrest, and she reappeared in Abbottabad in February of 2011. So, tell the audience, you know, kind of what role the daughters played, and the and the and the role of his two uh, wives with PhDs, and kind of how he approached things. You know, uh, Peter, I had learned from your earlier work about about the fact that his wives had PhDs. I didn't, I didn't know that before. Certainly we don't have their PhD certificates, but it was very helpful to know from your work that they had PhDs because the very first letter that I read of those letters that had been declassified by the CIA was by his, uh, 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 by his wife, Siham, whom you uh, discussed, she has a PhD in Quranic grammar. And uh, the first paragraph of that letter, she's writing it to her daughter, uh, Khadija, and uh, in it she says, um, you know, I'm writing to you in haste because I'm helping your father with his public statements. And so that was, that was an eye-opener. Um, but, uh, but clearly later on, and I see from the names of the files and the family notebook, the, how involved the daughters, Maryam and Sumeya, were with their, with their father. It's interesting that when Khairia managed to make it, we also know because of Khairia, because when she managed to make it to Abu Tabad in, in February 2011, her son Hamza was still in North Waziristan. She was writing letters to him. And in those letters, she was telling him about Maryam and Sumeya and praising them and singing their praises. And she would say to him that their writings are being broadcast on television, meaning that when they're when the father, when Bin Laden was, was delivering his writings and being broadcast, this was what, what the girls were doing. They were doing that. We know, for instance, the, the Arab Spring uh, draft uh, statement. Uh, this took a long time to draft. The situation was highly unpredictable. The, say, the, the, the events were, were both a source of, uh, a source of proud, a pride for uh, for the Bin Laden household, but they were also um, they were left with many question marks. Earlier on in the notebook, Sumeya tells her father, "I didn't see anybody discussing the brothers in Al Qaeda." And then you know Bin Laden saying, "Oh, I heard a journalist mention Al Qaeda before." So they're really struggling to see whether she had still has an ongoing relevance. And we find some of the names of the files there. They're named under the name, you know, under Sumeya's name, under Maryam's name. This is their edits going. It went through at least 16 files. We find Bin Laden explicitly soliciting the, their input and, and so on. Um, uh, the, the wife's role, I mean, clearly uh, Siham played a, played a very important role. Um, Khairiya less so simply because she was detained for 10 years in, in um, in, in Iran, but it is very clear that um, that this was not something that that Bin Laden only did in Abu Tabad because uh, his one of his letters to Khairiya um, when he thought that she wasn't going to be able to to join him, his security guards refused to allow Khairiya to join him uh, for a while. Um, he wrote to her and he said. You know, we're all, you know, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry that you're, I'm, you're not going to be able to join me. But um, we are all preparing um, public statements that will be delivered, to be delivered, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of 9-11.
So you could do things to help me here. I'm sharing all the things that, that I have on my computer. If you have any ideas to help us, please share with me your ideas. So clearly he thought, just as he thought well of Siham, he thought very well of Khairia. And, um, and so that, that suggests to me that, um, that the wives were all, always played a supportive role in, um, in bin Laden's life. And in, in fact, we have some of the poetry by Siham um, that she, she composed for her daughter's engagement back in 1999. It was so political, so political. You mentioned this this notebook. It's a it's a family notebook that they began writing as the Arab Spring. Uh, <clears throat> it was mischaracterized by the CIA as a Bin Laden journal. It's really a Bin Laden family journal. But sketch the scene for us a little bit about why did they, you know, why did they start writing this notebook in early two thousand eleven, and how do you know what what was the purpose and who was contributing and. Uh, the younger wife uh, doesn't a mild doesn't seem to appear at all. So what what was happening inside the compound as they were writing this two hundred and twenty four page or uh, diary or journal? So um, this was actually a, a second notebook. A first notebook had not been recovered, and uh, here's what I can sketch what, what what happened. The cover page of that notebook does say that this was going to be Abu Abdullah's memoirs, uh, that is Bin Laden's memoirs. And the reason I think the CIA made this mistake is because the first few pages were a form of a kind of Q&A between uh, Bin Laden and his daughter. Now, here's what happened, according to Nali Lahwi. Now, um, the uh, Al-Qaeda's leaders had sent Osama Bin Laden um, a list of questions. They wanted him to write biography or something that they would keep on the jihadi website. They'd sent him a 40 page um, list, of, list of questions to start, you know, about his earlier career, his earlier life. There's, so that would, that would kind of help him put together um, his, his career and, and, and about his journey. So he and his daughter had started doing this. And the first page, a few pages, this is what they were doing. Now, um, the cover page says that this is a continuation of volume one. So clearly they ran out of paper um, when they were working on the first volume. And they had this one because they had to, they had to stop doing his, his they, they prioritized the events of the Arab Spring over his biography. So they had plenty of more blank pages on this one. So they kept going with using, using that uh, that would have been starting either March 6 or March 7, I think, um, when they started recording these. But clearly they had been doing it before. Um, the, the notebook also, I expect that they had many of these notebooks. Um, the notebook also was used to summarize some of the things that were being said on the radio. And on occasions, um, so on one page, and this is when I found out that it was actually his daughter who was transcribing it, because on one of the page, she is writing her own notes, and she uses the feminine declension. And this is when I got it. I said, yeah, this is, this is certainly um, a female voice here. And in one other sentence, she says the father. So I clearly put the two together that I realized that it was, it was the daughter transcribing it. But it was also used as a uh, uh, sort of to, to draft the letters. So later on at the end of the notebook, we find, a, you know, what are the notes that are going to go into the letter? So Bin Laden and his daughter are sitting down, they're discussing what the, what the letter to Atia, Bin Laden, his top associate is going to include. We find them taking, it, taking notes on this. So it wasn't just family conversations. It had a multi-purpose use. And I expect that there were, many more notebooks like that that have been destroyed. But specifically, I think they had started writing about the Arab Spring on a notebook earlier than March 6th. Does that raise um, kind of an interesting question about what the limits of documents are? Because you're saying that there were previous notebooks that haven't were either destroyed or weren't recovered or, you know, the, the thing, I mean, it's an unanswerable question on some levels, but and, and, and no, no, you're absolutely right. And I think I do say earlier on in the book that not everything was recovered. And I didn't write a complete narrative. 
but I did write on the basis of what we have. I didn't try to um, to kind of provide to 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 go on and say. So, for instance, I didn't I didn't take the secondary sources. I didn't try to to reconcile the letters with secondary sources because after I saw that there is a complete a, a radical gap between the secondary sources and some of the letters particularly on issues to do with Iran, with Pakistan, and so on and so forth, I decided that I was going to allow the letters to, you know, to speak, even if it's an incomplete narrative, I would rather have an incomplete narrative rather than reconcile it with secondary sources. Now, um, but there are, as, as many historians uh, would say, and particularly those who work on archives, we can always sometimes reconstruct certain things from the existing letters. So there are, there are many instances when I didn't know what was the original question was, but I knew that the, the question was being put. There were certain letters that included certain things that I didn't know had been raised. And I only found out about them in the letters that were responding to these questions. So we can always reconstruct certain elements um, that, you know, certain elements of the letters. But, it, but of course, and I, and I make that very clear in the book, that I am producing an incomplete narrative. In the three minutes we have left, two, two, one quick question uh, from uh, the audience. How many people were part of Al-Qaeda around 2010? Just give us an estimate based on what you know. I couldn't say, I couldn't say. What I, wanna, what I also wanna say is that for instance, and I don't want to underestimate, um, uh, underestimate this. For instance, uh, Yunus Al-Muritani who is it was somebody who was tasked by bin Laden to carry out, uh, to lead, to lead the, the unit to carry out these oil tankers. This is somebody who really impressed me. His letters not only impressed me, he impressed bin Laden <laughs> uh, 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 quite a lot. This is somebody that I hadn't heard of before, um, before the raid. So I wonder whether there were, you know, how many others that we, we don't know of. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I, I I, I I can't I can't speak about numbers. Uh, it's but but there are many um, many other militants who are operating in the Fatah that had nothing to do with that. And and just in the two minutes we have left, um, you know, what was Bin Laden's attitude to the Arab Spring? Because obviously there was a certain he was excited about it, but he also knew he had nothing really to do with it. So. What was he in the in the last weeks and months of his life of his life? How was he thinking about this event, which was in his own mind so momentous? He initially he rejoiced. He really rejoiced that they were able to bring down the dictators. But as I said, he was naive about international relations. He thought that that somehow we're going to be able to guide these protesters. That you know we'll have we'll we'll set up this. Uh, a Shura council that will give them advice and so on. I mean, these protesters were really not gonna, we're not gonna buy into Al Qaeda's plans. And, and this is where, you know, the, it, it, is, it, it is horrifying how ignorant he was about international relations. And this is, this is ultimately on that basis that he should, have, he should be judged. Yeah. Well, uh, Nelly, thank you for the presentation. Uh, thank you for the great book, uh, the Bin Laden Papers, um, doing very well on Amazon as we speak. Please uh, get yourself a copy. Um, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Lahoud for this presentation. Thank you for uh, listening to this, this uh, and uh, we'll wrap it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.